Good afternoon. Matt, you had a phenomenal story tonight. <laughs> Get that joke if you didn't look it up. <laughs> a little delayed reaction in the back. Uh, before I get to the events of today, there's a few items I wanted to update you on, uh, things that have happened since our last briefing yesterday. Uh, the President spoke with Prime Minister al Abadi of Iraq to thank him for his productive visit and meeting on March 20th. A readout of that call should have been issued out to the pool last night. Uh, yesterday, he also notified Congress that a national emergency declared Executive Order 1360, uh, 13694 regarding malicious cyber-enabled attacks will continue beyond April 1, 2017. As you all know, this notification is required by statute in order to extend the national emergency that the past administration declared. The President believes that this significant cyber-enabled activities continue to pose an unusual and extraordinary threat to our national security and economic prosperity, and therefore he has determined that it was necessary to continue this national emergency. Last night, a federal judge in Hawaii put an indefinite hold on the President's executive order that was issued on national security. Uh, the Department of Justice is reviewing the ruling and is considering the best way to defend the, process, the President's lawful and necessary order. This ruling is just the latest step that will allow the administration uh, to appeal. Just a week ago, the U.S. District Court in the Eastern District of Virginia upheld the President's order on the merits. The White House firmly believes that this order is lawful and necessary and will ultimately allow to move, be, uh, to move forward. This morning, we announced that the President will host President Xi of China at Mar-a-Lago on April 6th and 7th. The President looks forward to, met to meeting with President Xi and exchanging views on each other's respective priorities and to chart a way forward on a bilateral relationship between our two nations. They will discuss the issues of mutual concern, including North Korea, trade, and regional security. And now on to some of the events of today. This morning, the President had a meeting with uh, Treasury Secretary Mnuchin. The Secretary, along with the National Economic Council and the rest of the President's team of experts, have been meeting uh, with and hearing from stakeholders on all sides of the tax reform debate. Tax reform has been a centerpiece of the President's economic agenda from the beginning of his campaign. The team is weighing the best option to develop a plan that will provide significant middle-class tax relief and make American businesses more competitive. Enacting the first significant tax reform since the 1980 is going to be a serious undertaking, and we are at the first stages of this process, beginning to engage with members of Congress, policy group, business leaders, industry, constituents from around the country, uh, and other stakeholders. Tax reform has been a part of the political discussion for years, and accordingly, lots of people have lots of ideas about it. Uh, we intend to hear from them. He and his team will continue to meet with those who support and oppose the various policy options as they all sit on the table because the President is committed to delivering results that the American people and American businesses will be able to see and feel in their paychecks. Uh, on the Hill this morning, the President was glad that the nominations of his Secretary of Agriculture designate Governor Sonny Perdue and Secretary of Labor designate advanced out of committee. Although he's disappointed to see that uh, Democratic senators who had previously expressed their support for Alex Acosta, the Labor Secretary designate, nonetheless, uh, who, while they had previously supported him, seemed to have stuck to a party line vote. The President looks forward to having them officially on the team and in the Cabinet as soon as possible. Also this morning, the Department of Commerce and First Responder Network Authority, FirstNet, announced that AT&T will build the first nationwide broadband a network dedicated to America's first responders. This step was part of the 9-11 Commission's recommendation on improving the ability of our police, fire, and emergency medical personnel to communicate seamlessly across jurisdictions, which is critical to their missions. It's also a sign of the incredible ability of public-private partnerships to drive innovation and solve some of our biggest problems while also creating jobs and growing the economy. Back to the schedule this afternoon, the President hosted a legislative affairs lunch on opioid and drug abuse. The lunch was an opportunity to discuss the goals and agenda of the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and Opioid Crisis, which he established yesterday. The Commission, which is going to be chaired by New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, is the next step in the President's promise to the American people that he would take real action to keep drugs from pouring into our country and corrupting our communities. Under Governor Christie's leadership and working closely with the White House Office of American Innovation, the Commission will bring together leaders on both sides of the aisle to find the best way to treat and protect the American people from this academic, uh, epidemic. Rather. Uh, many members uh, in attendance of the lunch played a key part in passing the Bipartisan Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, also known as CARA. 
the first major led, uh, federal addiction legislation in over 40 years, which authorized over $181 million to fight the opioid uh, epidemic. Part of the mission of the President's Commission will be to ensure that those funds are spent efficiently and effectively. Uh, too many lives are at stake to risk uh, wasting any money on this effort. Moving on, later this afternoon, the President will welcome Prime Minister Rasmussen of Dem Dem Denmark for a working visit. We'll have a readout on their bilateral meeting for you at its conclusion. Uh, a couple follow-ups from yesterday. I know Hunter asked uh, about the House uh, and Senate passage uh, disapproving of the Federal Communications Regulations on privacy rules uh, from last year. So let me just expand on that a little and get to your question. Uh, the White House supports Congress using its authority under the Congressional Review Act to roll back last year's FCC rules on broadband regulation. The previous administration, in an attempt to treat Internet service providers differently than edge providers uh, such as Google and Facebook, reclassified them as common carriers, much like a hotel or another retail outlet. Uh, and open their door to an unfair regulatory framework. This will allow service providers to be treated fairly and consumer protection and privacy concerns to be reviewed on an equal playing field. The President ple pledged to reverse this type of federal overreach in which bureaucrats in Washington take the interest of one group of companies over the interest of others picking and winning winners and losers. The President has signed more legislation under the Congressional Review Act, ending job-killing rules and regulations than all previous Presidents combined already, and he will continue to fight Washington red tape that stifles American innovation, job creation, and economic growth. Uh, Jeff was here yesterday, Roberta's here now, but following up on Jeff's question, he asked about the Administration's position on the Paris Climate Treaty. Uh, we are currently reviewing issues related to the agreement and expect to have a decision uh, by the time of the G7 summit late May-ish, if not sooner. Uh, before I take your questions, I want to speak quickly about Judge Gorsuch again and the process behind his nomination and confirmation. From the beginning, I think the President's been clear and 100 percent transparent about his choices, uh, how, what, if he had been elected, who he would choose from. As a matter of fact, I'd say that the level of transparency is probably unprecedented in modern times, at least. He, during the campaign, he gave the American people a list of 21 judges, which he would pick his choice for the Supreme Court from. The American people sent him to the White House to nominate one of those judges, and he did it. Prior to the President making his final decision, the White House spoke with 29 senators, more than half of whom were from the Democrat side of the aisle, including every Democrat member of the Senate Judiciary Committee to seek their advice and consent on the nomination. The consensus was that the President's pick should be a respected mainstream judge. As I've laid out many times before, from unanimous consent of the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals to the extraordinary low rate of majority opinions accompanied by dissent, Judge Gorsuch is a definition of a mainstream respected judge. He has offered the Senate plenty of material to vouch for that. Since his nomination, Judge Gorsuch met with nearly 80 senators. In response to requests from the Senate Judiciary Committee, Gorsuch, Gorsuch provided the following, over 80, 70 pages of written answers about his personal records in response to 299 questions for the record by Democrats on the committee the most in recent history, which he submitted within six days of receiving the questions. Over 75,000 pages of documents, including speeches, case briefs, opinions, and written work going back as far as college. And over 180,000 pages of email and paper records related to the judge's time at the Department of Justice. In fact, the Department of Justice provided access to many documents that would normally be guarded by various privileges in a, in, in a historically unprecedented move in the spirit of cooperation with Senate Democrats. And the judge sat for three rounds and nearly 20 hours of questioning by the Senate Judiciary Committee, during which he was asked nearly 1,200 questions, almost twice as many as Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, or Ginsburg. The White House and the judge did all of this in the hopes that Senate Democrats, many of whom already had announced their intent to filibuster George Gorsuch's nomination, would look beyond their political games and see for themselves how eminently qualified he is to sit on the Supreme Court. Unfortunately, it looks more and more like Senate Democrats would rather do all that they did in reading and questioning for nothing more uh, than to than political theater. Uh, finally, before I take your questions, a letter uh, was transmitted uh, just recently to the ranking member uh, and chairman of the House and Senate Intelligence Committees uh, that said, in the ordinary course of business, national security staff discovered documents that we believe are in response to your March 15, 2017 letter to intelligence community seeking, quote, documents necessary to determine whether information collected on U.S. persons was mishandled and leaked, end quote. 
uh, we have and will uh, invite the Senate and House ranking members and chairman up to the White House to view that material uh, in accordance with their schedule. Uh, with that, I'd be glad to take a few of your questions. Cheryl. Um, thanks, Sean. I'm, I'm trying to gauge the probability of a government shutdown at the end of April. Are your directions to the Capitol Hill to hold firm on the spending cuts that the President wants or to try to wheel and deal and get a bill that can keep the government open? I don't know that they're mutually exclusive. Um, I think we want push back on Capitol Hill from some. Well, I, there generally is, uh, but I think that we want we want both. I think we want to maintain um, some of the spending priorities as well as some of the reductions in the 2017 budget. Uh, we want to do so responsibly and do so within the priorities that the president's laid out. I think his funding requests and priorities are laid out in the budget that Director Mulvaney detailed and sent up. Uh, for the remainder of 2017, uh, there are some key things in that. And I think that uh, that it is going to begin a conversation that we will continue to have with the House and Senate. Uh, but I don't think both of those goals are mutually exclusive. Obviously, we don't want the government to shut down. Um, but we want to make sure that we're funding the priorities of the government. John Decker. Thanks a lot, Sean. I wanted to ask about some news that the President made today with a, a tweet that he put out on Twitter. He seemed to be taking a fight with the Freedom Caucus. And the Freedom Caucus, as you know, has 30 members. Does the President realize how important this caucus is, this coalition is, in terms of passing a replacement bill for the Affordable Care Act and passing the rest of his legislative agenda? Well, of course he understands that the goal of all legislation is get to a majority in the House, majority in the Senate. Um, and so, but at the end of the day, he recognizes that he has an, a, a bold and robust agenda that he is trying to enact, that he ran on and told the American people that he would do when he was president, and he's going to get the votes from wherever he can. And he passed that agenda without the help of the Freedom Caucus. Well, there's two questions. One is, I mean, mathematically, yes. Uh, but secondly, I think that there's a few members of the Freedom Caucus, both prior to last Friday's vote and since then, who have expressed a willingness to want to uh, work with him rather than necessarily uh, as a block. And I think that the, there continues to be um, some promising signs uh, in that, with, 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 with that. So again, I think part of it is is that I think if people are more concerned with voting as a block than in, in what's the best interest of their constituents and the American people, he's hoping that people will see uh, the bigger picture, the goals that we outlined, and, and in sometimes not like the really good be the enemy of the perfect. And he seems to imply in that tweet that he would um be in favor of primarying some individuals in the Freedom Caucus who oppose his agenda. Is that correct? Did I read that correctly? I, I, I'm going to say, I'm going to let the tweet speak for itself. For, for those of you who think, um, or just for your understanding, it would be improper of me to discuss the election or defeat of any candidate from this podium. Matt. Thanks, Sean. Uh, two questions, if you don't mind. I want phenomenal questions from you. That's what I'll give you. Uh, first, we know now. Um, <laughs> you get I, just, I know I got it. Uh, so two, two White House officials, according to New York Times reporting, provided uh, Representative Nunes uh, with the information that he spoke about last week. And according to the Times, um, the senior director for intelligence on the NSC, who was hired by Michael Flynn, started going through these documents after the president's tweet, with the wiretapping tweet. So I'm wondering if the White House thinks it's appropriate for national security officials to be conducting what's basically a political task, which is trying to find information that then validates something the President said. Yeah. So I've read the report, uh, and respectfully, I think your question assumes that the reporting is correct. It does. Uh, and, and so I'm, I would just suggest to you that the letter that was submitted earlier to the ranking, the, the chairman and the ranking members of the two committees, two intelligence committees on the Hill, the reason that, uh, that the White House has asked them to come up is to view that information. And again, uh, I don't want to get in front of that, as I've said before. I don't. I, I we are not as obsessed with the process as much as the substance, and I think that our goal is to uh, to make sure that the ranking members of both committees, as well as the chairman, see the information um, that um, the materials that that are important to this, and then worry about the the the, the outcome at the end of this. And then uh, on a different topic, with Miss Walsh's departure today, uh, are you expecting any more staffing shakeups in the West Wing? No. Catherine. Sean, are you saying that the New York Times report today is not correct? Um, I'm saying that in order to was... in order to comment on that story uh, would be to validate um, certain things that I'm not 
at liberty to do. For days you and, haven't been able to tell us who we met with. And I understand that. And, and again, and I think that there is an assumption, as I've said before, we cannot condone the, the – I mean, in the same way that you protect sources, when I call you and say you've got 18 anonymous sources and you go, well, I can't reveal my sources, Chairman Nunez, in conducting an investigation and a review, has an opportunity to have his sources. Uh, our view was is that the smart move was was to make all the materials available to the to the chairman and the ranking member of the relevant committees, um, and I understand the the obsession with the process piece, um, but we are focused on the substance of it, and I think the goal is to make sure that people uh, have the substance uh, that are looking into this that we have asked to look into this, uh, so and the go. White House did make materials available already. No, no, I, I they we have sent a letter within the past few hours. Uh, to both of those committees, uh, informing them that we wanted to make that available to them. And what kind of message do you think this sends to people watching this? I, mean, does it I think it sends a, a message that we want uh, them to look into this, that I think that as we have maintained from all along, that I think there's a belief that the President has maintained that there was uh, surveillance that occurred during the 2016 election um, that was improper, and that we want people to look into this and take the appropriate legal responsible steps to both understand it and then address it. Major. I want to read to you something you said here at the podium on March 23rd when you were originally asked if the White House might have had any role in providing information to Chairman Nunes. You first said it didn't make any sense to you, and you went on to say, and I'm quoting you here, I don't know why he, Chairman Nunes, would brief the Speaker and then come down here to brief us on something that we would have briefed him on. It doesn't seem to make a ton of sense. So I'm not aware of it, but it doesn't really pass the smell test. There's now reporting, which I can't tell if you're disputing or not, that identifies two people within this White House as the sources of this information. So I'm just trying to put these things together. Right. And Where you said that doesn't pass the smell test on March 23rd. Now there's reporting well, that I, I think again, it is within the White House that they were the sources of this. I'm just trying to put those two things together. Right. So number one, the first quote that you're reading, if you actually go back, I was responding to, I, I was very clear that I said, based on what Chairman Nunez has said, I believe okay. the following doesn't make sense. Something that. So the, I'm guessing well, that's an that you've learned something new since then. So please tell us. What right, you and again, learned. no, no, because again, Major, I, I've commented on this both yesterday and today that your obsession with who talked to whom and when is not the answer here. It should be the substance. In the same way that when you guys print a story with 18 anonymous sources, your obsession is the substance. It seems now that you continue to, to look at it from a backwards prism, which is, you know, what happened, who drove in what gate, who did they meet with, what were they wearing that day, as opposed to what's the underlying substance of this? Did something happen in the 2016 election? Was leak, did leaks occur? We are not going to engage actively in that kind of leaking that has been a problem. In fact, if you look at uh, this, the Obama's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense that is out there, Evelyn Farkas, she made it clear uh, that it was their goal to spread this information around, that they went around and did this, and she said, quote, uh, that's why there's so many leaks. They have admitted on the record that this was their goal, to leak stuff to, and they literally, she said, on the record, Trump's team. There are serious questions out there about what happened and why and who did it. And I think that's really where our focus is in making sure that that information gets out. But can't the process, from your vantage point, validate the importance of the substance? Well, I think there's a review that we've asked for and probably for you told us that you're willing to look into and ask and questions about the process and provide us answers. And, and no, oh, no, 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 I, I don't, don't, please don't put words in my mouth. I never said I would provide you answers. I said we would look into it. Our, the responsible thing for us to do is to provide the individuals and the committees who are doing the review the materials that they're looking for, or some of them. We don't know how many, what they're exactly looking for, what they've seen, and what they haven't. Our goal is to be as forthright as possible. They asked the intelligence or the, the intelligence communities and others in a March letter for information. We have decide, we have are willing to provide them uh, with the information that we have, uh, the materials that we have come across. And I think that is an important step. Again, it is not our obligation is to make sure that a review is done, both in the House and the Senate, as we asked for a few weeks ago, not to make sure that we illegally leak out information to you. And when you say we have information, are you disputing the reports in the New York Times? I'm not commenting on the reports, Major. I just I just got asked the same well, question. You're saying we, so I'm just no, trying no, to no. find out their I, names. I'm saying no. We, the meaning NSC, the White House, is not, White House, is not is not going to start confirming. For the first time. I, I get it. We are not going to start commenting on one-off anonymous sources 
uh, uh, that publications publish. If it were wrong, would you tell us? I'm not going. I'm not going to get into it. I, as I just said, I get it. How many times you can ask the same question, Hunter? Thank you, Sean. I have two questions. Um, the first, President Trump is pushing for a major tax cut, increases in defense and infrastructure spending in the border wall. Does he think this agenda has to be deficit neutral, or is he open to plans that might initially add to the debt? Well, I think when it comes to tax reform, um, he's got three underlying goals. One is tax simplification. Two is to lower the rates. And three is to uh, grow jobs in the economy. And I think part of it is is that if you look at it dynamically, uh, as the plan develops, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we're not there yet. We are beginning that process of engaging with stakeholders. As the plan develops uh, and there's a cost put on it, that's going to be a decision that gets uh, looked at as well as what are the economic growth and job creation aspects to it. So to answer that question without knowing what the what the full scope of it is, is looking at something and answering it in a, in a vacuum. And then just to clarify one thing with the New York Times story, I know you won't identify Congressman Nunez's sources, but isn't it abundantly clear that at least some White House officials had to be involved in him getting information here because they would need to help him access the complex? Um, I, I cannot get into who those individuals were. Right, but uh, it was someone at the White House. No, right? they well, to help him out. Again, it's, I, again, if I start going down the path of confirming and denying one thing, uh, that we're going down a very slippery slope. I've made it my position very clear on that. Jessica. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Um, thank you for announcing the visit of the Chinese president. I have a couple of questions about that visit, um, if you'd entertain me. Um, can you talk about the location and how it was chosen for this visit? Uh, there is, as you can imagine, on any trip, no matter who the, the foreign leader is, there's a lot of discussion that goes back and forth between uh, the White House, the State Department, and the equivalents uh, of the other head of government's, uh, you know, their, their appropriate counterparts. Uh, and those are kind of things that go back and forth in terms of how long, the activities, what will be discussed. Um, every single thing is, is discussed on both sides. Um, and so that was a long and um, ongoing negotiation with the government of China and uh, and with their representatives, uh, lasting several weeks now. So how did you arrive at Mar-a-Lago? I'm not going to get into House. the back and forth. I would just suggest to you that uh, both sides discuss various locations and uh, topics and agendas and, and uh, length, et cetera, and aspects to the trip. And this is what we've arrived at. So what is the goal for the White House uh, to accomplish during the visit? Well, I think there's a, there's a few things. One is I think this is an opportunity for President uh, Trump to develop a relationship in person with President Xi. He's spoken to him on the phone a few times. Um, but we have big problems, and I mean, everything from the South China Sea to trade um, to North Korea. Uh, there are big issues of national and economic security that need to get addressed. And I, I think there's going to be a lot on the table when it comes to that over the two days that they will talk. Lastly, the Chinese are expecting the White House to provide some sort of framework for the relationship to be viewed for. Are you prepared for that? And, and can you talk a little bit about what that framework might be? Can you expand on that a little? Uh, kind of a, a put a floor under the relationship, looking for how to view the relationship. Obviously, you had the, the rebalance and the pivot in the prior administration. Right. Is there a tagline or a vision for U.S.-China relations that you will roll out during this visit? We'll, we'll, we'll see. I'm not. We'll, if you have any hashtags, let me know. Um, but, but I think right now we're not worried so much about slogans as much as progress. Uh, there's a lot of big things that we need to accomplish with China, and I think that we will, we will work on that. Kristen. Thanks, Sean. Did the President direct anyone in this White House or in his national security team to try to find information or intelligence to back up his assertion about wiretapping? Um, I don't. I'm not aware of anything directly. I'd have to look into that in terms of, again, there's two sides of this. One is the information side, and two is the policy um, and the activities and the, the legal piece of what, what happened. Uh, and, I, and I don't, there, there's, those are big buckets, if you will. So it's possible. It's possible. I, I, I'm not going to comment on it. And, and one more. Don't sort of the daily questions about this make it necessary to have some type of outside independent investigation to lift any lingering cloud that there may be? No. I think you have two committees um, looking into this. The FBI has been looking into this. As they mentioned at the hearing, I mean, how many do you want? Uh, I, I understand that you may not have, that there's... the House Intelligence investigation is still valid given all of these questions? How, how is it not valid? I mean, I'm asking, I mean... There are all of these questions about where <coughs> Devin Nunez got his information from. And where that's why I think that we have invited to, to all of the relevant... Cloud. Would it not be smart no. to have an outside independent No, well, again, I'm not, right now, I think you've got the FBI, 
uh, other probably other intelligence committees that looked in the 17 of them issued a, a report earlier in terms of uh, involvement in the 2016 election. Um, and then you've got two two congressional committees looking into it. So I'm not really sure the, the exact need. I think that people are doing, I understand sometimes there's a need for you guys to have more information and more sources. I think this is being done in a responsible way where people are being discussed uh, what they know at an appropriate classification level and information is being shared. Can you just quickly talk about the timing of inviting um, the leaders of this investigation to the White House now? Is it because of this report? Why not do that initially? Well, I think a couple things. One is um, they they asked, they tasked um, the various committees in mid-March to, or the, you know, uh, agencies rather, to provide information. Um, we felt we had information that was relevant and, and I think there were some you know, uh, there's a desire to make sure that, that both sides of the aisle uh, who are looking into this as well as both chambers had that information. I don't, um, Anita. Um, Eric Trunk gave a interview a few days ago to Forbes magazine in which he said that he would update his father regularly, perhaps quarterly, on the business, including giving profitability reports. Um, so I have two questions about that. One is have they spoken about the business since January? <coughs> And two, how does this not violate what the president set out as the protocols for how he would deal with the business? Well, two things. I, I don't know if they've spoken. Um, I, it's not, you know, that's maybe. Uh, everything that he's done is in accordance with what the counsel's office and the ethics folks. Just following up, I believe he said that he wasn't going to talk to his children, his sons, about the business. So well, how I think is that? I, I, again, I, I, I think everything that is being done in terms of reports uh, or, or updates is being done in a consultation with, with the counsel's office. Uh, so I, I think that's Justin. Um, can I, I have two things I want to ask. The first is to just follow on major and ask about the substance. It's sort of unclear what you guys are telling um, the the chairman and the ranking members you have. Is it information that would validate the president's claims about surveillance during the 2016 campaign, or is it information about their broader Russia investigation? Yeah, I'm again, and, I, and I'm not here to to share that. That's that's why we've invited them up to view it in a classified setting, in an appropriate setting. It's not uh, not to be shared with. People that don't have the appropriate clearances and, and access to you're not in, intending to imply that this is the information that the chairman Nunes has been talking about. No, I, I'm what I'm suggesting is is that the that there has been information that has been uh, material that has been made uh, come to to light, and that we want to make sure that the people who are conducting the review have that information, have access to it. All right. And then um, Westinghouse Energy filed for bankruptcy yesterday. Um, I'm wondering if that's prompted national security concerns within the administration and if there is any effort within the administration to um, sort of help them navigate uh, this bankruptcy considering the... the I'll have to management. check on that. I think there's obviously a couple departments that would be interested in that. Steve. Judge, I just want to ask you to elaborate more on what you have so far told us. You said that in the ordinary course of business, the national security staff discovered documents. Can you explain? How these documents were uncovered? What is what does it mean? Yeah, I, I don't think no. I'm not. I'm not. That's that's why we've invited them up for a classified into a classified setting is to for them to see these materials and understand it. It's not. This is not the setting that is appropriate to discuss that. So who in the national security staff then uncovered the documents? Good question. That is not. Again, I as I've mentioned multiple times, we're not here to go through the process. Our job is to get to the substance of this and to make sure that the people uh, who have the appropriate access and authority to look into this matter and then take appropriate steps have, have that. Are you in a position right now to deny or rule out the possibility that I, I'm not, the National I'm, Security Staff have yeah, already I, informed I, I'm the not, Chairman of the House Intelligence right, Committee? I, I'm not going to get into any further details on this. I would just suggest to you, again, if I can go back for a second to, to something that the Obama administration's Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense noted very clearly on the record that they were engaged in an effort to spread information uh, about Trump officials that had come up in intelligence. That's not, a, I mean, that is, um, several networks, uh, Evelyn Forecast made that proclamation about what was going on during the Obama administration regarding the Trump team. So that, that is something that they made very clear on the record. John. Uh, a couple of things, John. Uh, first of all, on the Freedom Caucus, in mm -hmm. response to the President's tweet, uh, Congressman Amash of uh, Michigan uh, responded uh, on camera saying, most people don't like to be bullied. 
in response to the president, also saying that uh, sending out such tweets is constructive in the fifth grade. It may allow a child to get his way, but that's not how government works. Could you take a moment to respond to Congressman Amash? Was the president trying to bully the Freedom Caucus? No, I think there's this is consistent uh, with everything that he has said since um, Friday of last week. Um, and I think that he is looking for members um, on both sides of the aisle who want to be constructive to achieve the goal of a patient-centric health care system. That's it, plain and simple. And I think that um, his comments and his tweets speak for themselves with respect to how he feels and why. Well, John, I, I, yeah. Following on that, is this a divide and conquer strategy? No, it's a, it's a math strategy, which is to get to 216 and pass an effort and, and continue to, to move the agenda forward. And then if I could follow on what Major said, you've, you've accused the people in this room several times of being more interested in process uh, than actually in the substance of things. But when information is discovered by the Intelligence Committee Chairman in the House at the White House that is potentially exculpatory to what the President has tweeted out, and it's reported that one of the people who was involved in uncovering that information is a White House staff member who was kept in his position over the request of the National Security Advisor by the political leadership here at the White House. Does the process not then take on some relevance? Well, the process in the sense that we are, as I've noted, we've invited the chairman and the ranking members who are looking into this and reviewing the matter up here. That doesn't mean that we allow uncleared members from the media to come in and look at it. Uh, that I'm means that that no, you are. You said, but but I think it is because that question. that's not what I asked. What I asked was, when you have that connection of dots all the way along, right. does the process? Does the providence of this information not become relevant to the overall investigation? It's up for the, the people who are conducting the review to decide that, not, not for the people in this room to decide it. It is up to the people who are clear to look at that information uh, and that material to look at it and make their evaluations. And I think they are conducting the review. You've seen very clearly both on the House side and then starting today on the Senate side, them looking into this matter. That is the appropriate venue, forum, and personnel to be reviewing it, plain and simple. Sean, a quick Zeke. follow-up on that. Zeke. Zeke. Uh, you mentioned Zeke. a couple of times Zeke. that... Um, Thank you. Um, when was, was the pres has the president already been briefed on this information that... I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. Has the president already been briefed on this information that you're now inviting the Congressional Committee chairs to come and, and, and view, and when was he briefed on it? I, I will look into that. I'm not entirely sure when or what the status of that is, but I can follow up on that. Why would you brief... Why, why would the White House brief... I, I, I understand the, the question. I Like I said, I will look into whether or not where, where that stands. Blake. Trouble on taxes. Uh, the, the timeline here had been health care first, tax reform second. There was a Fox poll out released yesterday that says 73 percent of Americans want tax reform to happen this year, mm -hmm. with health care now at least being on hold. Is health care the number one priority for this administration? Is tax reform the number one priority for this administration at this point, or is health care still kind of taking up some of the oxygen? Well, I don't know that he's, it's taking up oxygen. I think there's plenty of oxygen for both to go on. I think the president would still like to see it done. Uh, but I think there's no reason that we can't. I mean, if you look at the timeline for tax reform, you're talking several months. Um, and so I think that the process is beginning on that, and I think you can have a dual-track strategy. It's not an either-or proposition. And you described what was going on with the meeting today as the first phase. Can you lay out to us what is somewhat entailed with that first phase? Yeah. Is, the, is the president being given detailed strategies or is it broad principles? What is involved in this first phase? I think it's a little of both. Uh, he's talk, they're talking about the process that they intend to partake, you know, uh, how this is going to lay out, who they're engaging with, how they're going to begin that process, and then some of the guiding principles and making sure that any, um, any updates that he has or any principles that he wants to suggest are incorporated into that, to that plan as they begin to meet with stakeholders. But part of this is to um, to level set with him as to what they tend to do and how they intend to do it. You just mentioned a dual track between health care and tax reform, but then there's also infrastructure right. hanging out there. So can all of those go go together? Lots of tracks. Uh, I mean, there's, again, remember, they're not all the same people. Um, some of them overlap, some of them don't. But I think part of this is, is that you got to remember that some things can happen sooner than others because of the, the legislative calendar. Some things are going to take longer because uh, of both the legislative calendar and and because of uh, the number of individuals involved and the complexity of the situation. But there's a lot of things that can be moving at once because of, of how they'll play out. John Gizzi. Thank you, Sean. Um, turning to the foreign front, yesterday 
Vladimir Karamiritsa, the twice poisoned Russian dissident and vice chairman of the Open Russia Movement, testified before a Senate Appropriations Subcommittee um, backing continued sanctions against Russia. He also called on Secretary of State Tillerson to meet with Russian civil society members, in other words, anti-Putin dissidents like himself when he makes his trip to Moscow next month. Mr. Karamiritsa also said he was meeting with many members of Congress, both parties, but he would be very happy to meet with any administration officials. Uh, are there any plans for the President or anyone in the White House to meet with Mr. Karamiritsa, and will Mr. Tillerson meet with the Russian civil society? Well, I would Moscow. suggest to you, I'm not aware of anything, yet. both the National Security Council as well as the State Department are probably more appropriate for you to address that to. Uh, Alexis. I thought it was just yesterday that you said that when you were asked who cleared in uh, Chairman Nunes, that you would ask some preliminary questions, mm -hmm. had not gotten answers, and that you would continue to ask. Yeah. So my question today is, you know the answers to that, and you are saying you will not answer that question today? No, no, that's don't not. don't know. Right. No, so what I'm saying to you is, is that the decision that has been made is to bring in all the relevant uh, uh, individuals that are reviewing the situation and make them available that getting into sources and process is not the proper way to conduct this review and we want the people who are conducting it to understand more fully the materials um, not necessarily who came in what time and whatever so you're just to clarify again you asked the questions you were not given no answers. no that's, that's I, you, I'm just you saying that they just I understand that wait let me finish no. you said yesterday that you asked you didn't get the answers and so what you're telling us today is you are never going to get the answer, you, yourself, you are never going to get the answer to who cleared in Chairman Nunes. No, what, what I'm saying is, is that the decision was made, it's supposed to focus on the process, to focus on the substance, and that the decision was made. I'm answering I, my question. I let you answer the, ask the question, so let me answer it, please. And the answer that I'm giving you is that, that the decision was made internally to focus on the individuals who are doing the review, both the Republicans and the Democrats, House and Senate, and have them come in and look at the materials. That's what the focus should be, Alexis. Right. Caitlin. But wait, 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 here's my bigger question. The that president has expressed his affirmation, his support for the finding that Russia interfered with the 2016 election. That is the centerpiece of the investigation at the FBI and the Senate Intelligence Committee. My question is, what, can you update this, what is the president doing now in the administration to respond to Director Comey's testimony, that that interference is not just election year based, but continuing. Um, what you're talking about the executive order, is that correct? I'm just asking, can you update? What is the administration doing to prevent that? To pre to so okay to respond to that preliminary finding already that we already know that it is continuing. Well, so the executive order that the president signed that continues the national emergency deals with uh, looking into malicious attempts and cyber attempts to, to come into the United States. That's what the, the executive order that he signed was. That's the sum total of the response so far. Well, I'm not going to get into what we're doing, what, what's being done behind the scenes in terms of the intelligence and law enforcement community, but the, the bottom line is that there was an emergency declared with respect to uh, challenges that the United States faces from a variety of of uh, actors outside the United States uh, to come in and, and use cyber techniques to hack the United States. The national emergency will continue under the President uh, to address the threats that we face from abroad and, and from a variety of places. That's it. April. Wait, Sean, Sean, Sean. 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 April. Uh, yes, Sean. Um, so, yeah. I'll get you. <laughs> he called on someone else. I'm sorry. Go ahead and then come back. Okay, to I'll do that. Caitlin and April. I'm sorry. She can go first, but I'll just go after her. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Caitlin. Um, so, Sean, what is the ultimate goal of, of the leaders coming in to get this information, and will it be information that Nunez received plus, or will it just be? basically a, a synopsis of a synopsis of what Nunez received. Well, it's going to be the materials that are relevant to 
uh, the discussion uh, in the area that they're reviewing. And that's up to them to decide the relevancy of that. I think we have, or the National Security Committee has gone into uh, come upon some materials that they want to share with them. It's up to them to make a decision about the relevance of those documents and what they lead them to believe. But I mean, there's two issues here. One, April, is what what do they see, and then what what do they want to see in addition to that, or uh, as a result of those of those materials, so right? So, in other words, they they may see things and say, "Hey, this is interesting. I wonder if there's a pattern. This is interesting. I want to see more." Uh, or they may come to conclusion right away. But that's part of the idea of to your first part of your question of sharing information with them is to allow the members of both of the committees on a bipartisan basis to come in and review materials that we think are relevant um, to um, the issues that the President talked about uh, with, respect, with respect to surveillance, the masking, unmasking of individuals, uh, the handling of it, et cetera, et cetera. And then it's up to those members uh, to decide uh, what to do with that information, how to, few, how to explore that uh, more in depth. So ultimately in their questioning, they can actually wind up getting what Nunez received possibly if they dig and ask different questions, uh, just sitting in the intelligence meetings like the President does, digging, if, if he decides to dig more, he'll get more? It, it depends. I, I think that's possible. I don't want to prejudge what they ask and what, what comes in response to it. It also has to do with what documents we have. They may go down a, a, a particular uh, trail and have to follow up with a with an agency and say, you know, we saw this. Can we see a follow up on that? Um, as you saw from media reports, uh, the NSA has been asked to provide documentation uh, to the House. My understanding from the reports is that that was was ongoing, and maybe some of the materials that they see prompt them to ask um, additional questions. But but that's that's part of providing it to them. It's an ongoing review, and what we want is is for them to see these materials and come to conclusions. Um, or, or need more information to come to a conclusion, but this is part of that review process. Are they allowed the same type of briefing I, I, with, I, with their ranking and who they are? No matter him being the head of the Intel uh, Committee, are some of these other members allowed to see the same things that he sees? Because even though they're not the head of the Committee, are they allowed to see that? My understanding would be that they would. Okay, and lastly, um, Sean, do you know who allowed him to visit? No. You don't know? No. Caitlin. Okay, I have two questions for you. Sure. One is, has anyone in the White House ever raised the possibility of a cabinet position or a top intelligence post later on in the administration for Devin Nunes? Not that I'm aware of. And secondly, will the President hold a press conference so he can answer questions on the surveillance claims and all these intelligence revelations himself? No, I'm not good enough. Not that you're not good enough, but will he, he's the one who made the claims. You didn't, I'm, I'm you didn't sure make the claims, so I, you made the claims. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I, I will convey your request to him. I know that I, I've done it before, and, and we'll see. I'm sure that at some point he enjoyed the last one so much. Is that what you like tomorrow? Is there, is there, does that work for you? Okay. Well, let me let me see what I can come up with, Cecilia. I, do, I just want to clarify. Do you believe, from what you know about these materials, do they validate the president's wiretap claims? I, I don't know. I have not seen the materials. Uh, it is members of the National Security Committee who have come across these documents that want to make them available uh, to the members who are leading the review. And, and why not? just be more forthcoming about this entire process uh, of who let Nunes in. If, if this was enough, if, if the President of the United States could tweak this claim about wiretapping, doesn't the American public have a right to know more right Yes, now? they do. And I think that's why we're going through a process. Is that I and, and I say this respectfully? I understand that you want all of those process answers. What day did someone come in? What were they wearing? What door did they come in? The relevant questions are about the substance of this, and 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 it's interesting. I don't get the same thing when I see these unpublished stories with anonymous sources. You don't ever tell me who your sources were. Who, Glenn? I'm actually asking Cecilia's question. If you could be as polite as not to interrupt her. Thank you. Do you accept his apology? That's very. In fact, I will see the floor to Glenn. Thank you. Uh, that's not how it works, though. Uh, but I, I would argue that that you guys have, when you write a story and you call and say, I have four anonymous sources that said whatever, and I say, okay, well, who are the sources and where do they come? You go, sorry, I'm not revealing anything to you, but the substance that I'm asking you to respond to. But when the shoe's on the other foot, you're all about the process. The bottom line is that there are two congressional committees that are conducting reviews of this situation. And those committees are looking at the relevant information and talking to the relevant people. To your point about the process, 
We have made individuals available and encouraged individuals to testify or to meet with or to discuss uh, with, with that, have been, that have been approached. So I think that what we are doing is frankly, and I know you probably disagree, but I think that we are doing the responsible thing by making sure that documents and materials are shown to people with the appropriate classifications in the appropriate settings and that the people that the different committees would like to discuss these matters with are made available to them. I think that's the responsible way uh, of, of handling this. Here, yeah. Sean, thank you very much. I have two questions, one on Venezuela and another one on uh, climate policies. And I'll start with Venezuela because today the Supreme Court in Venezuela said they they decide to take over the Congress powers and the opposition said that it's a coup underway. Do you consider that it's a coup underway in Venezuela and what is the uh, what can we expect the United States to do? And the other question is on climate change because President Obama signed also bilateral uh, climate deals with um, Brazil, China, and India. And what do we have to those? Uh, well, on the first one, um, respectfully, I would send you to this. I would refer you to the State Department. I'm, the only Supreme Court I'm really focused on right now is is ours and getting Judge Neil Gorsuch confirmed by the Senate. Um, so I'd be glad. I think the State Department's more of an appropriate venue to discuss. Uh, the activities uh, over there, and on second, I think when it comes to uh, to things like the Paris Treaty, as I mentioned at the outset, um, that that is being. Uh, I understand, but but I think that there are things that uh, we will have updates for on on all of these things as we move forward. Right now, I've got nothing on that subject yet. Thank you, Sean. Yeah. Um, the Wall Street Journal reported this morning that the Trump administration is proposing more modest changes to NAFTA. Like, for example, they're leaving the arbitration panel that deals with trade right. disputes in place, et cetera, et cetera. Is the, is the White House backing away from some of the more sweeping changes to NAFTA that, that the President proposed during the campaign? You know, I, I would just argue that, that um, Robert Lighthouser isn't even nominated yet. That, that is not a statement of administration policy at this point. Uh, there is nothing that in those documents that we are confirming, or in that report, rather, that we are confirming. Uh, that is not a statement of administration policy. That is not an accurate assessment of where we are at this time. And I think our goal is to get uh, Robert Lighthizer appointed as the next ambassador and U.S. Trade Representative. Uh, and then when we have that, we will have plenty of updates on where we go with respect to NAFTA and the rest of our trade agreement. Uh, with that, I'm going to say goodbye. I will see you tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. I promised two days in a row. Thank you. Uh, I got one on foreign policy and one on domestic policy. Okay. Uh, first one is uh, many Republicans were very critical of how President Obama had handled the uh, Iranian Green Revolution about six years ago. So my question is, if mass protests across Russia develop into a movement, is this something that, uh, what does the administration feel its role should be regarding that? I'm not going to, that's a hypothetical question to talk about what would happen and if I think no, when it comes to, I, I know, but when it, with it came, with it, when it comes to protest, uh, we obviously encourage, uh, as we did last Sunday, the peaceful pro, the, the, the government of Russia to allow the peaceful protest of individuals uh, throughout their country. Uh, we obviously support the, the people to have a voice in every government throughout the world. And on the subject of partisanship and, and obstructionism, whose responsibility does the president feel it is to uh, put an end to partisanship and uh, who needs to be reaching out to whom collectively? I think it's a it's a two-way street. I think we, um, you know, I, I, I think part of it is that, you know, we, we, uh, the president and the first lady extended an invitation the other night for everyone to come. I think we were excited to see a third of Senate Democrats come. Uh, I wish we had seen more. Uh, there's an opportunity, I think, to engage in a, in a discussion about some of the issues and come together. But I, I would argue that, you know, when you look at, at this fight on Gorsuch, I mean, there are, I, I don't, disagree with the fact that if you're a Democrat, you probably don't necessarily agree with some of the rulings and some of the philosophies of Judge Gorsuch. I get that. But at the end of the day, the, they have always agreed. In fact, in most cases, the filibuster has never been the norm. It hasn't. And, and it is odd to see that these individuals who have uh, – it's one thing to, to vote no. It's a one thing to say that we don't agree. But to now turn to filibustering or threatening to filibuster Senate uh, unbelievably qualified people, and there's nobody that I'm aware of, even on the left, that is suggesting that Judge Gorsuch isn't qualified to serve as a Supreme Court justice. Republicans in the past have allowed Democrat presidents to have their nominees voted on up or down, and for the most part, when you go back through President Obama, President Clinton, um, they have been, Republicans have joined with Democrats to allow people who are qualified to go onto the court. 
And to see this new precedent be formed by Leader Schumer is disappointing because this is a huge, huge crack. I think there was a column in one of the papers today. I think you are really fundamentally changing um, how the Senate's going to operate by doing this. And I think that's an important, uh, you know, they, they can disagree with him philosophically. I get that. That's, but when you have an election, you can assume that the, a Republican president is going to choose Republicans for appointments and for uh, federal judgeships, and the Democrats will do the same with, with, with their time in office. But it was Obama's, you know, uh, nominees that got through all with Republican support. And it's difficult to understand why, uh, when you've got someone as eminently qualified as Gorsuch, that this is the stake that they want to drive. And I think it further sets a partisan divide in our country when we can't um, allow people who are qualified, uh, and universally so, uh, to get on the bench. Is that not being done from the president's side? To try I think to so, sure. Um, but I think it's a two-way street. I would ask you, you know, what what is, um, you know, I remember few years ago, there was all this talk about from the get-go of Obama, Democrats made hay about how they wanted to see him as a one-term president. Um, I, I've seen a similar tactic from Democrats now about how they, they want to defeat him, they want to stop his agenda, um, and there's no sense of them wanting to work with this president. So at some point, I think we have shown a willingness to bring them together. Um, it's amazing how many senators, when you talk to them, um, over the course of the last, you know, almost 70 days, have said, you know, I've been to the White House more in the last 70 days of a Trump administration than I was during eight years of an Obama administration. And I think that that speaks to the president's desire to bring people together um, and to find common ground on areas of mutual agreement where we can move the country forward. Thank you. I'll see you tomorrow.